In today's episode of the KC Sports Authority podcast, we are joined by Jack Johnson of the Locked On Royals podcast to talk a little Royal Spring training. Hey, what's good, y'all? It's your boy JD6 here with my man. Shout out to KC Sports Authority. Make sure y'all go check that podcast out, man. You heard the man. And welcome back into another episode of the KC Sports Authority podcast. If you listen to the spot, the podcast over on Spotify, thank you so much. Make sure you are hitting that like button following there. If you're watching us over here on YouTube as well, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button right there on the screen. On our way to 500 subscribers, we're hoping to get there here in the next couple of weeks with all the fun stuff coming up and your support would help us out. You can also hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at KCSAPod. Well, like mentioned, we are joined by Jack Johnson there below of Locked On Royals. He's going to talk to us a little bit about the Royal Spring training so far with opening day just about two weeks away. Uh, two weeks from the time this posts, two weeks exactly from when this will post. And so a lot to kind of get into there with him. But Jack, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast with us. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you, John, fellas. Always a blast uh, to join you guys to talk some Royals baseball. Yeah, and Royals baseball seems to be heating up. You know, the Royals are pretty solid at being a a, uh, a fun spring training team to watch. You know, they get off to that hot start um, like they seem to do every year. Guys look pretty good at the plate. We always talk, you know, spring training, kind of take it for what it is. You know, you said it on, a, on an episode this week, you know, it doesn't mean whatever the numbers are, doesn't mean they're playing that well or that poorly. Uh, spring training is just kind of one of those those gimmicky things that isn't always the best indicator of how the season will go, uh, but can give us some insight. So I want to start with, you know, obviously you spent uh, about a week down there a few weeks ago for the first couple games, um, and since then have obviously been staying up to date with with a lot of what's going on but what are some of your takeaways so far from spring training who stood out to you you know who are some guys that have maybe performed better than you anticipated or guys that have really struggled so far yeah i mean like i said with with spring training it's so tough to really identify you know who is thriving and and not doing so well based off numbers as you guys are fully aware of baseball doesn't really allow allow that much of the games you, know, you get the MLB app and you may get, you know, hits and outs and strikeouts and walks, but you don't know how hard somebody's throwing. I mean, yesterday, I think it was the first stat cast game for the Royals. And of course, Cole Reagans was on the bump and he had his worst outing of the spring. So that's just, you know, the of course moment of training. But it can be so tough to really identify who's doing well or who's hitting into bad luck. You know, it's if a guy's really hitting well, is it because of the Arizona air or is he actually changed a few? that he's hitting a lot better. Uh, But if I was to go back to my time in surprise and then what I have followed along, I think MJ Melendez looks really, really good. Um, I think that he has tinkered a little bit more with his stats. Uh, We knew in the second half last year, he kind of changed his hand placement a little bit. Um, And even though for those listening, not with a streaming service here or being able to see the camera, like when he first was struggling in, in the first half, his bat was just kind of on his shoulder. So he's having to go from his shoulder up a little bit, back, and then loading. So you kind of saw some wonky swings at time. His timing wasn't there. Then they simplified it at the All-Star break. He kind of lifted his hands up a little bit, and he had an OBP north of 340 in the second half. Now it's almost like Jason Kipnis a little bit. Remember how Kipnis would have his hands all the way back? And the reason was for, for success is that your hands are already there. So it's just the weight transfer at that point. You are simplifying your stance. And I think MJ's looked really good with it. From what I've heard, from what I've seen, he's hitting the ball really well. He's hitting the ball the other way. And I remember Royals broadcasters saying that last year in the second half. The sign of him getting was him going the other way. It wasn't trying to pull everything. We know about the power that he has. But when you can just effortlessly glide the ball the other way, that's going to get you more hittable pitches because then guys don't know how to throw to you. You know, in the first half, they knew exactly how to pitch to MJ Melendez. And he was striking out a lot. He was rolling, rolling base. I would not be surprised if he's one of the better hitters to begin uh, in April. I could always bite me in the butt. You know, I'm kind of been sticking my neck out there for MJ Melendez in this offseason. But I really do believe there is a player in there and a player that's going to come around a little bit. Uh, Does so it I- kind of remind you of, uh, oh, I think it was 2013 maybe when Moose was struggling a little bit and Again, he saw that power going to to right field, but that year he finally started sprinkling the ball the opposite way and making uh, pitchers change up on him. Does it kind of feel like Melendez is probably in that same spot? 
Yeah, a little bit. I think with Moustakis, the tough thing for him in comparison to MJ was that, you know, Moustakis at that point was out of, you know, he had nowhere else to turn. He had been demoted uh, in 2014 to AAA. So it was like, I got to change or they're not going to play me. Uh, if MJ would have been demoted last year and then made that change, I think it would have seen the similarities. But with the one thing with MJ is he's very coachable. Uh, a lot of people love to bag on him and dog on him for how bad he was in the outfield. Okay, well, let's go back to the offseason last year. He spent the entire time catching and working on improving his framing skills. And then he shows up to spring training. He's a catcher. And then shortly into the season, they go, okay, go play right field. Learn how to play right field, which is one of the hardest positions to learn on the fly in Major League Baseball. He doesn't have any experience out there. Then they say, not right field, go to left field. So no wonder he's not great out there. He's trying to learn that position on the fly after spending all offseason being a catcher. I do think we'll see improvement there defensively. And when that defensive ability improves, the mindset improves, that you have more confidence of, hey, if I'm not hitting that well, at least I'm fielding my position. Or maybe if I'm not fielding that well, I feel confident in the plate. So that's what I think I've taken away so far in spring training. He's looked really good. And also being down there in the person, he looks bulked up a little bit. He was one of the bigger dudes down there. He's always been seen as athletic, but he's got a lot of power in that bat. And I think you can see in the, the physical form, this is a guy that can be a middle of the lineup bat. Now, I can give him all this praise, but at the end of the day, he's actually got to go out there and perform and show that he is that type of second half player. It feels like there's a lot of guys like that in the lineup to where like, you, you can count on them, but have they proven it yet? Like you, Garcia is a guy we're all high on. Yeah. Massey showed some flashes down the line. You know, Nelson Velasquez, if Drew Waters, I mean, we literally can name the entire bottom of the roster with, it could go either way. Um, a guy that maybe, even though he should probably be in that category, we regard as more proven. And Vinny Pasquantino, I'm getting back at it. I know his contact, his hard contact rate wasn't high early, but he still was making contact. He wasn't striking out. Mm -hmm. How have his progression been getting back into the swing of things? Yeah, I was not super surprised that he had a little bit of a slow start to spring training, just because I think he was so fired up and ready to go. I mean, all off season, you could tell that he was just chomping at the bit to get back out. Back out. He called himself a caged animal at the Royals rally when we were speaking with players. And you could see that early on, like he wanted to go out there and really let it fly. But what's so important when analyzing Vinny Pasquantino. I'll go as far to say this is the healthiest he's ever been. Uh, I, I know that that's a, a cliche saying in spring training, you know, but the first year, you know, he had that shoulder or chest problem. And I don't think that ever fully healed going into the next year. We saw the numbers dip a little bit. He still was above league average, but it wasn't the same Vinny Pasquantino we saw in his rookie year. And I think last year, as hard as that was for him, it was the right time for his career to make sure let's get everything structurally sound because we know when you're healthy, the type of player that he can be. I mean, all off season long, you heard a lot of people within the Royals talking about they're treating this as an off season acquisition. They only had him for a couple of months last year. I mean, they didn't even have him until the, the all-star break, right? He had fallen short, I think in the Miami series. And then he, you know, he gets sidelined with the labrum tear. This is, it's going to be brand new to their lineup, basically a fully healthy version. And that should be really, really exciting for Royals fans because at the end of the day, and I feel like I've said this a few times before, this is the best pure hitter on the team. Bobby Wood Jr. is the best player on this team. Vinny's the best pure hitter because he's so well-rounded in his approach. He hits the ball incredibly hard where he excels, and Bobby doesn't is seeing more pitches, walking a little bit more. And that's always going to favor a hitter like that when looking at the advanced ad analytics, the saber metrics, you know, fan graphs, all that type of stuff. They're going to favor those guys that love to take the walk. And I think for Vinny, that bodes well for his game uh, because when you try to adjust at the big league level, if you can't lay off pitches, you're going to be found out very quickly. We've seen that with the Royals prospects before. But since he has that ability to lay off it, it's hard to figure him out because he can spit on a lot of those pitches. And I think. Assuming he stays healthy, you're going to see a guy that has a good chance to be an all-star representative for the Royals. I think he's that good of an offensive bat. Defense is never really going to be there, but in terms of a pure offensive threat in the lineup, about as good as you can get when healthy. Yeah, we Chris and I talked about this in the offseason. Um, the addition of Vinny getting back, if he's back to the form that we think he's capable of, 
it'll be kind of nice to see a Royals lineup that maybe one through five, one through six, you're really not as worried about now. You've got enough variety of different types of, of hitters to, to where you're not just going, all right, there's the guy that they can pitch around to get to so-and-so next. Like, it's going to be nice to see a Royals lineup one through six, maybe even one through seven, that on most every day, they've got guys that can make a threat at the plate, uh, especially with the way Michael Garcia has been hitting. I mean, obviously today as we're sitting here recording, just popped another homer. Um, how about a guy like Hunter Renfro, though, who's a, an addition to this team that obviously started out spring training with the, the injury, hasn't really had a lot of time yet. Are you concerned at all or any worried that it might be a slow start to him? Obviously, hasn't looked good numbers-wise, but a guy that really got a late start that they weren't you know concerned with early at getting that playing time. But what should we expect from him now that he's kind of getting a little bit more time at the plate? Well, I think even if Hunter Renfro doesn't improve from last year, you're getting a guy with a lot of power in that bat. And I think that's something the Royals loved. I compared it a little bit to the Kendry's Morales deal back in 2015. Not similar players, but more so what the Royals looked at. And I remember with Kendry's, it was a weird 2014 for him. Like he didn't get a spring training and the Twins signed him middle of the season and he just sucked. He wasn't good at all. And the Royals and Dayton Moore in the front office looked at him and said, we get him a full spring training, we're going to feel pretty good about what he can become. Because before that, we really liked the type of hitter that he was. And with Renfro, I see somewhat of the similarities. I think they are very much intrigued about the Milwaukee Brewers version of uh, Hunter Renfro, the Boston Red Sox version. Because those were back-to-back really good years for Renfro. And then you go to this past year with the Angels, you know, you can look at it and make excuses. I'm not really going to do that for Renfro. I, I think a lot of it fell on him, maybe not being as durable, uh, maybe having too much swing and miss, but the power was there, right? The power was absolutely on display for Hunter Renfro. Today was actually the first time I had a chance to see him in live action, right, on the TV broadcast, and he had a really good seven or eight play, uh, pitch plate appearance. Thought he looked really poised, didn't look like he was flailing at everything, looked healthy, swing looked pretty good. So I'm not overly concerned about the back tightness or whatever he had. But yeah, I mean, he can be one of those candidates where if he gets off to a slow start in April, you start to wonder how long is that leash? Because the unfortunate reality of bounce back guys is really what leash do you give a bounce back guy? Like if they weren't good last year, do you let him go into June or July and they're still not performing well? Is it a quick, you, you hook him after like May or April? I mean, the Royals gave him, Technically a two-year deal. They believe he is going to tap into that player that was two years ago. That was three years ago. And I think the positive side of it is that it's not like this was four years ago. If Renfro was a good player four years ago and had three straight really bad years, I don't think I'd be as high on him getting back to where he was. Like, think back to Jackie Bradley Jr. last year. He was a really good player like five, six years ago, but it had been really bad the last three. That was never going to work. With Renfro... You're just asking him to become what he was two years ago. And that can be a big time positive. I think if he cuts down the swing and miss just a little bit, the rest of his game is going to play. I think he's going to be able to hit the ball well. I think he's going to hit the ball hard. I think even in a down year, he's going to give you 20 home runs. In an up year, he can give you 30 home runs. And that's, I'm sure, what the Royals are hoping for. He's got a cannon arm and right. Not great side to side. Doesn't have the, the biggest range. But again, last year, who in right field for the Royals did. That's not really a position they value defensively and never really have for that matter. But I, I am excited to see what he looks like. I don't think he's going to be as bad as Fran Mill Reyes was last year. He's not going to be as good as what Kendry's Morales provided the Royals in 2015. But you find that wheelhouse a little bit, hell, you put him in the six hole and he gives you 25 bombs, OB, OB 315, 320, and a WRC plus over 100. I'll take that nine times out of 10. Yeah, certainly can't complain if that's the numbers he kicks out. Uh, how about uh, any yeah. about the Renfro signing? Maybe it's just because I rake with him on MLB the Show every time <laughs> I get him. But you know, I love the Renfro signing. <laughs> um, yeah, you've been I, waiting for that signing for a couple of years now. <laughs> yeah, no, always wanted Renfro. Just, just like him, man. How about uh, the guys like you know that might be considered fringe players still? Kind of talk us about you know the Nick Prado, Velasquez, Nick Lofton, some of those guys competing for that kind of few spots there. Who stood out to you the most? I mean, Prado's looked good. Numbers-wise, looked pretty solid. Do you think he's done enough to get a spot opening day? Same thing with Lofton. Yeah, I'm not ready just yet to give up on Nick Prado. I just, I really have a hard time believing the swing and miss is totally gone because of spring training. Like, Nick Prado's doing exactly what he should be doing. He is 
making it a tough decision for Matt Quattro and that coaching staff. You so well, you hit so well, they say, okay, we got to give you a spot on the roster. But it's also spring training, right? Where do you just say, okay, Nelson Velasquez had a bad spring. Let's not put him on the big league roster. Let's give Nick Prado that chance. Well, and that's maybe being too reactionary to it. That's being too judgmental about games that, in the end, don't matter. I think Nick Prado does play at some point in Kansas City, but I would like for him to start in AAA so we can know for sure that swing and miss is gone. Nick Prado last year in Omaha or Kansas City never fixed that. It, it was a strikeout problem from top to bottom. And that I want to see ironed out more than just spring training. I'm not overly concerned about Nelson Velasquez's slow start. I think he's going to be just fine. And I do believe he's got the first crack at the DH spot. Doesn't go well. All right. Then Nick Prado, you're going to be next man. Side note on this. I don't know if you guys, you know, were had the chance to watch the game today. There's no way in hell Nelson Velasquez is a buck 90. He might be 240. I saw you tweet that out a while ago. I mean, this guy looks significantly bigger than he did. I mean, his butt, he's got a Jesus Aguilar build almost. I mean, just really, really big. And that's where I look at him. I go, man, it's a DH. This is the type of filled out guy that you want. And if he goes in there, he doesn't need to hit, what was it, 15 home runs in 40 games. He doesn't need to do that. But I would like to see the guy he can become. I, I think when the Royals went after him, it was we were hearing down in Surprise, Arizona, that was a very much of an eye test find. Like there was a scout looking at him in uh, would have been Iowa for the Cubs. And they just said, this guy's got immense power. We got to take it. The bat is too thunderous to just not take a chance on. And he's blocked right now in Chicago. And he comes over to Kansas City, kind of becomes a, a phenomenon in just about a month or two. So I would like for him to get that chance. I thought he looked pretty smooth in the Puerto Rican Winter League. Heard only good things about that. So because of a couple of bad games, I don't think I'm going to put Prado ahead of him. As for Nick Lofton, yeah, that's probably the one I'm the most disappointed in because then I think he's going to make the opening day roster. But in the end, it's not going to be such a bad thing because I feel like right now Nick Lofton needs to play every single day. I don't think the Royals are willing to make that change with Massey just yet. If Massey has another year like he did last year, hitting a buck 18 until May, they're going to make that shift. Now, what I'm curious of is if they make that shift, does it go to Adam Frazier? or Garrett Hampson, or does it go to Nick Lofton? I guess it comes down to how is Nick Lofton playing in Omaha. But like Prado, he's doing everything in his power to make this a tough decision for the team. And that's what I come back to with Nick Lofton. Like, this is not a not a, a minor prospect. He was a first-round pick. There's a lot of talent uh, in Nick Lofton. He, I talked to him a little bit in surprise. He said he's been working a lot at first base. That's another element uh, that can put you in a big league roster, just being flexible, being coachable, and the Royals have a lot of those guys. But it's good to see those guys get to Kansas City because, man, there's a lot of guys out there too, too, not willing to change their positions, that are not willing to adapt. And fortunately for the Royals, a lot of guys are willing to. I want to jump to the the pitching staff a little bit because I think, you know, we talk about this fifth spot. I think that was set in stone pretty much from the day they showed up. Lyles was going to get it. But the bullpen's kind of changed quite a bit. Um who are we kind of thinking? I know McMillan went down. Zerpa's making flashes. Lynch, you know, who maybe was the only one that could have taken the fifth. Now looks like he may, I don't even know if he has options, if he has to make the roster or what. But, like, kind of how are you seeing this bullpen shape up? Yeah, I, I think it's slowly starting to form. Um, not in the way that I thought it would, but it's because of those setbacks with Hernandez and McMillan. Um, I think that Alec Marsh has earned a spot in this bullpen, uh, whether it be in the rotation, like if Jordan Lyles – can't really get built back up again. It wouldn't shock me if they said Alec Marsh is going to be the fifth starter until Lyles is healthy. Or if Lyles is healthy or they go with Daniel Lynch to the fifth spot, I think Alec Marsh deserves a spot in the bullpen. His stuff to me is too good to just keep stashing away and saying he's not going to become something. I mean, I've heard the velocity is up. I heard the spin rate is really good. Uh, he is a physically minded guy, so he's constantly tinkering with stuff, wanting to get the best version of himself. And that intrigues me a lot. I mean, the the face value numbers last year aren't going to pop, but I just look simply at the strikeout numbers. I mean, he struck out over 10 guys per nine last year. You could put that in the bullpen, and there's something to work with a little bit. So Alec Marsh, I think, takes that spot of John McMillan for now. Then I think they want a lefty. I think they want another lefty in the bullpen to pair with Will Smith. I mean, you've got the locks right now in Will Smith, John Schreiber, Nick Anderson, Chris Stratton. Uh, and James MacArthur, those five are locks. And, and final three, 
mean, you look at Alec Marsh. I think Josh Taylor's pitched really well in spring to spring. Kind of hard to just toss him aside at this point. He's got options, I believe. But the Royals clearly have some value in him because when they acquired him from Boston, kind of we talked about Hunter Renfro, they looked to the year before and said, hey, he was a very valuable reliever. We're willing to look past an injury-ridden season. So Josh Taylor's got a really good chance. Sam Long has been, I would say, pretty exceptional and surprising as a non raw He could be another lefty. Uh, I think a long shot would be like a Walter Pennington, uh, who's really been impressive in spring training. Um, Daniel Lynch could grab that spot as a long reliever. Angel Serpa uh, has looked pretty good. So that feels like the battle for a lefty spot. And then it comes down to, can Carlos Hernandez be built up? I, I think he had just started throwing. He's got two weeks to do so. So I'm not too high on Carlos Hernandez beginning the year in Kansas City. So at that point, you might take a combination of, you know, Alec Marsh in the bullpen, Serpa in the bullpen, and then Daniel Lynch just to stash some guys you're used to and have pitched in the big leagues in Kansas City. So that's kind of the eight I envision right now being there on opening day. I think if Brents could be healthy and look like he did two and a half years ago, I wouldn't mind that. But yeah, he's he looks like he's still got a long ways to get back to, to good form. But all right, let's kind of as wrapping up here, just a couple just kind of quick fire right off the top questions. Uh, do the Royals keep three catchers to start the year with Austin Nola? Oh man, great question. I'm gonna say no. I don't think there's really a need to. I know Austin Nola can play a couple different spots, but Freddie for me is not playing more than once or twice a week. Why add a third catcher just to give some extra value behind the play and the play waste the roster spot on that? Noel's got options. Keep him in Omaha. All right. How about uh, on, on the pitching side? Does Daniel Lynch finally tap in and either overtake Jordan Lyles as that fifth starter or force the Royals to do the, the opener or six-man type rotation? I think the Royals wanted them to. I mean, man, they've always been high on Daniel Lynch, but where I'm so concerned, especially in Arizona, he's not throwing hard enough. I, I thought he looked good today against the Angels, but if you're sitting 90 to 92 and your command isn't pinpoint or you don't have a great secondary and third pitch, what type of value is there really? I'd rather take a chance with somebody else who either throws harder or has got more swing and missed stuff. There's still time, but man, I would have loved to see Daniel Lynch come into spring training throwing 94, 95, 96. Because you come from the left side, he's got that slender build. It can work out well for you. But right now, unfortunately, I'm going to say no. I do not think he beats out Jordan Lyles and the rest for the number five spot. Does Nelson Velasquez lead the team in home runs this year? Probably not. Uh, that would be, you know, you talk about two of the best trade deadline acquisitions that a Royals GM has made. If they give up a Roldis Chapman and Jose Quas and get a, a 30 home run guy and a, a Cy Young contender in Cole Reagans. But I think Nelson Velasquez probably ends up in the range of 16 to 20. That feels very fair to me. I still don't know if the league's figured him out yet. We're going to find out very early on in the season if he can uh, adapt because we saw last year, right? He was a fastball hitter. You threw him an off speed pitch, he wasn't going to come close to hitting it, kind of Pedro Serrano like in Major League. <laughs> Uh, but I do think the the leader in home runs this year got to either be Bobby Wood Jr. or Salvador Perez. Or, or, you know, Vinny could run into 30. I'm not sold that he's a 30 home run guy just yet. Salvi and Bobby, though, they've proven they're 30 home run guys. So I'll go with one of those two. And I got three quick ones left. But, Chris, anything you want to throw out? I just want to know where he thinks Bobby's going to finish in MVP voting and where Cole's going to finish in Cy Young voting. Those are the two I was going to throw out there. <laughs> okay, well, well, perfect. Works out well then. I, I think Bobby Witt Jr. can finish top three if the Royals are good. That's going to be yeah. a big, big uh, question mark around that. If the Royals aren't good, he's not going to be top five because you kind of look at it and say, well, how many MVP votes should a guy get if the team loses 90 games? But if the Royals are in it, you got to think that he is playing at an MVP level. Uh, I mean, if the Royals win 85 games, let's say, I'd imagine Bobby Wood Jr. has topped his numbers from last year. As for Cole Reagans, kind of the same thing. Man, if he stays healthy, I really don't have any fear for, for what – I'm so confident in what he can do on the mound and what he's shown that you know everybody out there is saying. I mean, this is a, a Jacob deGrom-level type of arm. If he can stay healthy, his stuff is nearly untouchable at times. Now, in spring training, you know, he got roughed up a little bit yesterday against some minor leaguers. He also threw five different pitches multiple times. I think he was just toying with, you know, what he could work with, as we see with some of the top arms in spring training. 
Uh, but I think kind of along the same lines, the top three finishes is very likely. If he plays the entire year, gives you 180 innings, the numbers are going to be good enough, in my opinion. And now you think about it, Garrett Cole's sideline for the first month of the season. So he can leapfrog Garrett Cole now if he's really good in the first two months of the year. So now the door has opened just a little bit more for him. But if I'm being honest, I think Bobby Witt Jr. has a better chance of winning MVP than Cole Reagans does of winning the Cy Young. 2024, and we're talking about the Royals being potential finalists in two of the best award categories for an individual player. Uh, last one I got for you. Uh, at some point in the offseason, the Royals were like plus 2,200 to win the division. They're now plus 1,000. How many times have you sprinkled something on that so far, or are you, or how confident do you feel that that is a bet worth tossing some change at? I don't think it's a bad bet to just throw a little bit of cash down. I mean, what's what's really the harm, right? If you throw down ten or fifteen dollars, okay, you, you spend that at a at a Chick Fil A on a on a Saturday. You know, you go down and get a meal at fifteen dollars. Maybe that's too high. Actually, you probably can get it cheaper there. But what I'm getting at here is. Those odds seem good to me. I mean, the American League Central has a reigning champ, of course, in Minnesota. And then you've got three teams that are interchangeable. Like, I think Cleveland, Detroit, and Kansas City at this point are all interchangeable. One of them is going to finish second. One of them is going to finish fourth. We know the White Sox are going to be bad, and they're going to finish dead last. Minnesota, I would like to just say, as a you know a baseball fan, and just to not be as hot, take it, go, okay, well, they still have a really good rotation, a really good bullpen. They're a division winner. But, man, I have to think, if you want to be a Royals fan and have hope, which is what I'm trying to do uh, in this answer, what if things go right? What if things go right and things go wrong for Minnesota? Like, Minnesota's had those years where they win the division and then just can't stay healthy. Like, this is all a, a possible scenario. The same way a scenario is the Royals can't stay healthy. But I look at the team they've assembled a little bit. Man, it doesn't hurt to throw down like $20 on those odds. Like, like what would be the harm in that? I, I probably will on opening day uh, just for the heck of it, just to be like, if it works, if it, it works out. But I'm really starting to convince myself, even if it's not a division title year for the Royals. I mean, that's a, that's a massive jump going from 106 losses to winning this division. I mean, that'll probably have to be a 30 to 35 win jump from the year. Yeah. That is substantial. I look at it and I've seen crazier things. I mean, looking in this division, Minnesota lost, I think, thing in 2016 and then got to the wild card round the next year. I mean, just like that. I mean, you you just never know when a turnaround can happen. We saw Baltimore have an incredibly quick turnaround, more so with a loaded farm system. But I just look around baseball and I think I, I'd, I've seen crazier things happen than just a really bad team winning a bad division the next year. So I'm going to throw some money down on it. Think it should be fun. I think even if it's not a division title year, there's going to be a lot of fun baseball into the summer and into the fall this year for Kansas City. There you have it, guys. A lot of optimism. Baseball season. It is March. The sun is shining. Opening day is almost two weeks away for what should be a very fun Royals season. But Jack, thanks again for hopping on with us again. He's Jack Johnson, host of the Lockdown Royals podcast. Go check him out if you're not already. Uh, he's been doing a lot of fun stuff with their podcast already, and they are completely taking off before the season, surpassing all of his goals before the deadlines that he threw out there and continue to grow. Hoping we can do some of the same there. So Jack, again, thanks for joining us today. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll talk again here in the upcoming season. Always a blast, guys. Thanks for having me on. And that'll wrap things up on this episode of the KC Sports Authority Podcast. Again, if you're watching over here on YouTube or listening to us over on Spotify, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Uh, wherever you do, check us out from. Thank you so much for the support. Continue to support. We've got a lot of fun things coming up. Big time March Madness Bracket Challenge coming, which I'll have some details out shortly after this episode posts. So make sure you are staying up to date on all that. Again, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at KCSA Pod for all that info down the road. He's Christopher Tenpenny, and I'm Keegan Russell. And once again, this has been the KC Sports Authority Podcast. We'll catch you guys in the next episode.